Hello, everyone, and welcome to Literature Based Learning in High School. Today, I have with me Rhonda, Sheila, and um, Sandy, and they are all expert sunlighters and expert with those high school kids. So let me tell you a little bit about each of them. First of all, Sheila is coming to us from her Florida home where she has three adult children, 22 or 20, 22, and 24. Now she started sunlight when her youngest was five and she put two of them completely through sunlight. Right, right, Sheila? That's right. So she also is looking at her oldest, graduated with a degree in finance. Um, her second is um, graduating from college next month with a degree in mechanical engineering. And her number three is a sophomore in college and aspires to be a nurse. Yes. Rhonda, she began her career as a teacher and came home to homeschool her oldest two when they were what grade were they in, Rhonda? You said uh, they were third and sixth. Six when when they came home, yeah. and then she ended up homeschooling all five of her children. And now she works as a co-op teacher um, there in Texas, right? Texas. That's right. For okay. Yeah, twenty years. Twenty years, and school. I have to tell you, all <laughs> of these ladies, you will see at some like conventions. If you haven't seen them yet, you will see them in the future. They um, are our Sunlight um, cons uh, curriculum consultants and they spend most of their time at our conventions. We know that a lot of those are canceled this year, but they are waiting and excited about future conventions. And then we have Sandy. Sandy lives in Texas. She has four daughters with the last one graduating from college this year. Um, she has a 13 year difference between her oldest and her youngest. And so she's continuously homeschooled for 27 years. Way to go, Sandy. Um, and around 20 years ago, she started with Sunlight um, going to conventions along with Rhonda. And like I said, SECs, all of them, Sunlight, uh, con Sunlight Curriculum Consultants. <laughs> we call them SECs internally. That's a little tidbit for you. <laughs> Yeah, makes it easier. Yeah. So um, today we're going to talk a little bit about literature-based um, learning in high school. Um, they're going to provide us, high schoolers are busy people, getting them involved in their education sometimes can seem like you're not, you're not capable, they don't want to, all those things. They're going to give us all kinds of tips and tricks and advice and how they did it and it's going to be really informative. So let's get started. Um, so the first question is very simple. Why literature-based learning? Why is it a good choice for high school kids? Rhonda? Well, you know, I'm just a slight passionate person about literature-based <laughs> and high school because even if you have a child who seems like, ew, reading, scary, if you can capture them and um, just stay with it a little bit, oh my goodness, the difference. And the reason why is because it grows them in all academic areas, not just literature. It grows them in wisdom. It grows them in maturity. It grows them in critical thinking. It's just freakishly amazing. And on top of that, um, college professors, I've read research about this whole thing, and they say, like, well, what, you know, somebody says, well, what should I do to prepare my high schooler for college? And the professors will say, read, 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 read. You know, I, I have an example there too. My oldest daughter, she was always a, a slow reader or she felt like she was and she was rather reluctant to read all the books. And when she got to college, the very first semester she said, thank you for using sunlight. She meant the literature, all of the books. And I said, why? And she said, now I know what you mean about being well-rounded. I've either read the books or I have read the subject matter. I can talk to my professors and my peers have no clue. She came to me three times that semester and said the same thing because it was so stunning to her. She was so surprised. Um, it just opened up a whole new world. And in fact, I would even find her reading books that a professor just happened to mention. So she missed reading all the books. But another thing is, is um, this is not just good for children who like literature. This is also for those STEM kids too. I have a daughter that is a, a nurse. And before she went into college, we knew it would all be science classes. 
So we wanted her to be well-rounded too. You know, a child that could talk to everybody um, that would that would have that conver uh, that general conversation with everyone. And so we did it for her and we found that what happened was it gave her a very complete picture. She could look at a whole patient now because she knew how to um, think outside the box. And see the whole picture, really. I think that's the, it's that complex thinking that comes about because you're looking at com when you're reading you are actually handling a lot of ideas at the same time. And so it's developing that ability to think globally, to think, to think in many different ways. So um, I just had a, one of my students came to me over spring break and she said, she's a senior in her nursing. And she said, Ms. Selmack, I can't believe it. She goes like the other girls, like just doing literature with you, I'm a better nurse because of my ability to think, my ability to put the big picture together because I'm like, it's not really me, it's the books. So why is reading so important, even for older students? Because sometimes we think of just reading picture books to little kids, um, but why the older kids? It's so important. In fact, there's uh, Naomi Barron is a linguistics professor from American University. And she says that reading successive pages, and what that means by successive pages, it means reading entire books, not snippets, not uh, textbooks, but reading successive pages um, it teaches us how to follow a sustained line of thinking and of reasoning. That's important because, again, you're building brain power. So it's for those high school kids too. It's for us actually, honestly, for us too, for anybody, because when you're reading an entire book, you're forced to look at pattern, you're looking at how ideas relate, you're, look, you're applying logic, you're connecting the dots, you're evaluating um, big ideas. Those are all critical thinking skills that is just coming naturally when you read a book. Um, and stick with it. And not only that, but when you read, it's also broadening the perspective of the person reading. In other words, they're getting a chance to experience something from somebody else's viewpoint. And indeed, I, I feel it's hugely important as a parent is I want my child to read about other ideas that are maybe not ideas that I'm really thrilled with, so that I have that chance to talk about them with them while they're underneath my little umbrella. And when they go to the big bad world or the big bad <laughs> university or whatever, you're not sending them like they've never talked about those things. You've, you've thought about it. Also, just interacting with, you know, God's truth and seeing how it works out for everybody when you don't really work with God's truth. Like, you know, Frankenstein, let's just like go against the grain and let's do our own thing. Well, how did it work out for Mr. Frankenstein to have, um, you know, people got murdered, people got, <laughs> he lost fellowship, all these things because he wasn't working within God's truth. So you're interacting with the idea of comparing God's truth to the themes that are in the story, critical thinking and action. What else? Okay, another thing, Jesus taught us in story. Why? Because he developed us to be relational. That's how we remember things. That's how we can be inspired to live beyond our own potential. Coolest thing ever though, too, is this. So my son has a doctorate in um, material sciences and he's a nuclear engineer. He works in the um, lab with spent uranium or something somewhere. And so, <laughs> so he does all these things. Do you know that to this day he'll say to me, hey, do you like have any new cool books? He's a lifelong learner. And it's because he just, even though he's STEM, it's, it's a whole picture there for him. So yeah, it's good stuff. <laughs> That's awesome. So as parents are out there trying to create a, a literature-based high school plan, how do you suggest going about that? Sheila? So, you know, when you hit the high school years, it feels a little bit scary because now everything kind of counts. When they're younger, you're, you're reading and you're having fun and it doesn't even feel like school. But you hit high school and you think, oh boy, you know, I don't want to mess things up. 
So it is good to, to go into the high school years having formulated a plan. The first thing that I would recommend when you are doing that is to consider what the local high school requirements are for your state. Each state is gonna be different, whatever number of credits, um, the, the types of credits that you have on your transcript, those are all going to be different according to your state. So the first thing you need to do is to do a uh, Google search that just says homeschooling in whatever your state is. So I live in Florida, homeschooling in Florida, and on the first page, you will find usually the state um, homeschooling organization. And those will often have what the requirements are for homeschoolers in your particular state. So that's your first step. Then the next step is to consider whether or not you have a child who's going to college. That's kind of hard to do when they're in middle school and you know they have hormones raging and they're just not being very uh, attentive to school right now. And so you think, oh my gosh, this kid's never gonna go to college. But in four years, they're gonna mature, things will change. So the best plan is to prepare them as if they were gonna go to college. And then if they choose not to, if they decide to do military or vocational school or whatever, at least they're prepared as opposed to if you assume that they're not gonna to go to college and you don't prepare them and then they decide for further down the line that they wanna go, then they have to take some remedial classes to be able to get there. So go ahead and plan for it. What I did was I, I searched um, my state university's um, freshman admission requirements. And so again, I just went, I didn't go to the top school. The University of Florida is really competitive and hard to get into. Um, and I'll, although I did have a, a child go there, that wasn't my, um, I didn't base everything based on that school. So I looked at the University of North Florida and I wrote down all the requirements for that particular school. So four years of English, four years of math, algebra one or higher, only three years of natural science, three years of social science, which would be history, two years of the same foreign language, and then two years of, of an academic elective. So that's only 18 credits. That's the minimum. That's not, that's not what we did. We had more than 18 credits on our transcript, but that is the minimum and that's what you have to, um, those are the things you have to check off for them to be able to go to that particular school. So that just gives you a, a, a place to be able to plan from, you know, so you're not reinventing the wheel. So consider your local high school graduation requirements, consider college um, freshman entrance requirements. So once you have those two things in place, then you can start to formulate your four-year plan. And what I like to do, it's, it's not scientific at all, it's actually pretty simple. You take a piece of paper and you fold it into four squares and that gives you your four years. And so then all I did was I labeled each square, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th, and then for each of the boxes, I have the four core classes. So math, science, English is what I call comp and lit, because that's what we called it. And um, H is for history or social science. And then I have a little arrow here to um, remind myself that I need to have some sort of elective so, th so that I could plan out what the four, the four year plan was. And then you start filling in those boxes. So, you know, if you're going to use sunlight curriculum, which is what we did, um, I, we, we looked at the catalog, we looked at the course map and figured out what the requirements were. I needed, I knew I was going to need to have um, US government and US history. So those were absolutely going on there. And so we figured out where. Um, in Florida, we can do dual enrollment beginning in the, the junior year of high school. And so I knew that we were going to take advantage of that because free college, heck yeah, we're, we were gonna do that. Um, and so I, started to fill in all my little boxes and, um, and made a plan. What I found was I transitioned from being the primary teacher in every single subject and to being like sort of, sort of like the guidance counselor. So although I did maintain primary teacherhood in some subject, I, I was not that for every subject. I was an English major, I feel much more comfortable teaching um, history and English over science and math. And I didn't want to hold my kids back in those areas because of my weaknesses in that. So I found ways to get around that. Um, so once you figure all that out, then you can also bring your kids in. 
when I was filling out my little map, um, I knew that my son Timothy was not going to be able to do every um, high school sunlight level because we offer six now and we only have four years of high school <laughs> and so i was like okay which ones are we going to cut out because we're not going to do 13th and 14th grade <laughs> so um so i gave him the options i was like okay you know you've already done 100 you have to do 400 you've done 200 so that leaves you with 300 and 500 which one do you think you would like to do and he actually, I was really surprised. He, he really took into consideration um, what I was offering and he gave it a lot of thought and I was very impressed with his response. And he came back to me and said, you know, mom, we've done a lot of ancient history because we did Core B, we did Core, a, uh, Core G. And so he felt like he really knew ancient, medieval, that kind of stuff. But he said, we always stop at um, World War II it's the end of the year. I'm tired. You're tired. We're all tired. The weather's good. We want to be outside. And I, we don't know, like the books finished there and I don't know what happens after World War II. And so much of our modern times is based on more recent history. So I think I want to do 300 modern world history because that'll give me a good knowledge of those years that I feel like I'm lacking. I was floored. I was like, okay, let's do it. So I had his buy-in, he got to choose, he had a great year, he had a very valid point, and I was very happy with, with the direction that we went in. And if I had told him this is what we're doing, then I, I wasn't going to, you know, I wasn't training him for when he was in college and having to make all those choices on his own. So I was able to come alongside and he was able to um, articulate a really good reason and everyone was happy. That's great. Um, Rhonda and Sandy, how do you engage your high schoolers um, in their own education? Well, I think I'll just kind of dovetail onto what uh, Sheila was saying that I think a lot of it is, is that you want to make sure that part of the engagement is by giving them some autonomy, like she was mentioning. And I think also um, changing your relationship from kind of that parental role into more of a mentor and a coach. And that's where, where she was talking about a guidance counselor. So sometimes you might have a child who you're like, oh my goodness, there's like no stinking way we're getting through these books. Well, because they may be reluctant or resistant, which is very different. Reluctant or resistant is very different than I can't, they can't or they have some reason. But even then, they can. Um, I've had children that uh, I've had two ends of the stick. I've had, you know, like smarty pants and can't keep them in books. And then I've had the, the kind where it's, it's a struggle. And, um, and really, if you looked at their testing, they shouldn't have been able to, to do the book reading, but they can. And it just takes patience and time because as you read the books with them and work with them, their muscles will grow. And it takes time, but they will. And then they'll get excited. And this is the engagement part they'll get excited because they see that they can. And so it's part of you. The other thing I think is, is removing the titles because some of the titles and being a little picky about which ones you want to do with them. And you might choose them according to a kind of, I always think of my kids as like my, my great masterpiece painting, you know, <laughs> although it's really God's, but anyway, <laughs> to say like, okay, so what colors do my kids need? What, what is left? And I try to help maybe pick some books. So what you might want to do is pick a few that you would with them that they think are interesting too. And then, and you agree like, oh yeah, these are things that I would like to put into my child, like ideas. And so then I would read those titles over the summer. And the engagement part comes, you guys, is because then you have the ability to really discuss and read some of those books. Not all of them but just a few, three or four. And this is where you're developing that relationship with your child and you're engaging with them. And I think that's the part that, because you, you're building relationship with them that will continue beyond college, so. And you're gonna have students that can follow the instructor's guide just as it is, no problem. You'll have some that just fly through all the books and want more, which you can go get more. There are those that really do struggle though and they can read a number of the titles you might want to do audiobooks and 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 Sheila um you have a daughter that you 
did something different with. Right. So my youngest is, is my daughter and she is dyslexic. Actually, two of my three are dyslexic, the oldest and the youngest. And um, when, when we hit high school, I was fully prepared to like, okay, honey, here's all the books, have fun. And she could not handle it. She could not. So what I ended up doing for her is I read aloud the history spine um, up until 11th grade. And so I continued the reading aloud. And then I remember that for level 300, I ended up dropping all, all of the history novels that were part of that, um, that piece. And then I further had to um, call more books out of the literature program. But at the same time, the oldest one was in, in a private Christian school here in, in town. Um, he wanted to go to high school, and so we made that happen. And he was in AP Lit, 12th grade AP Lit. And that year, that AP class read six books. So I, I, I thought, you know, if my son, who I'm paying big money for to go to this school, he's in, an, he's in this advanced placement class, and they're only reading six books, then for me to trim my book list down to like 12 for my mm -hmm. dyslexic younger child, not a problem. And so that's what, what we did. And so, yes, we did use some audiobooks. Um, I did, you know, stay engaged with her and we would read. I read aloud the history piece. So it's very doable. I, I, I have some people that will ask me in the sunlight booth, oh, well, my child is dyslexic, you know, sunlight is not going to work for me. And I'm like, oh, no, no, no. It works. Let me tell you mm -hmm. why. And it's because yeah. the, the parent is really engaged. The child is reading interesting mm -hmm. material, not dry textbook stuff. And, um, and, and you have the freedom to tailor it for your own child. So just because the book list has 20 books doesn't mean you have to read them all. That other child that I mentioned, Timothy, he read every book and then, and then some, you know, he was like, okay, mom, now what? And he was tearing through them, but my daughter couldn't. And so I love how flexible a literature-based program is for high school. You can tailor it to your child and it counts. Like it just because it's a little lighter than what your other child is doing doesn't mean that they get any less credit. It is just as rich. Right. Mm -hmm. Cut it down. Yeah. You know, and another word about audiobooks, they're really good for any child because it's another modality that you're learning from. Mm -hmm. But then again, here we are, we're talking about reluctant readers, too. Um, if you have somebody who, it, maybe you're coming into literature-based uh, curriculum for the first time, and they're not a strong reader, or again, they're reluctant, what do you do? You encourage them. You keep asking them, pushing them, gently, but pushing them to finish the book, and the next book, and the next book. Um, because I say that, when we entered, I, now I used sunlight for 20 years, but prior to that, I hadn't found sunlight yet. I had homeschooled for seven years prior to that. And so when my oldest entered sunlight, she had to read Anne of Green Gables and it almost killed her. The sentence structure was very complex. She just struggled and she kept saying, I can't do this. I'm a slow reader. And I kept encouraging her to finish. It took her longer than the instructor's guide, the number of weeks. We went to the next book, same thing. Oh, this is so hard. And I just encouraged her. She did a little faster this time. And then at the end of the third book, it was, this was surprising to me. She came to me and she said, I know what good literature is now. There are plots and subplots and character development. I love these. I can never go back to the middle school series books that she had been reading. It really made a difference. It opened up a whole new world to her because now she could think with these characters. You know, it wasn't the same character in every scene like you find in those series books. Um, it was just totally, totally different for her. Um, I'm just so grateful that she just learned to love reading. And she, it, she reads any genre now. Now, that's not to say every child will do that. No. But it is important to know that you need to encourage them to do the next book and the next and see where you get. Mm -hmm. and, and besides just encouraging and, and carefully choosing books for them, another way to engage a child is to um, add projects that you can think of. It was wonderful. That Sheila was reading the history spine, supporting the child through, this, uh, through the work. Absolutely. Um, 
again, don't forget field trips. That is a fabulous way to engage. And, and you know, in this day and age where we are right this moment, now we have all this access to free stuff you know, to go see online. So absolutely, go for it. Do those things too. Also, don't forget, um, you know, if you just are dying to sneak in like one more Shakespeare, just because you feel like it, um, <laughs> don't forget like a play, watching a play or, or, or pay attention to what happens to be in your community and go because th nothing like that to bring understanding and engagement to the child where they're like, wow, that's kind of cool, where maybe they wouldn't have been so thrilled. Yep. Great. Let's talk a little bit about transcripts. Because I think a lot of people are like, what do we do about literature-based um, mm -hmm. learning with transcripts? So what did you guys do? Candy? Well, you, know, you know, it's not as hard as it, it seems to be. Right. There are so many resources out there, books on how to do a transcript. I did mine on, on Excel. Mm -hmm. I made it myself. And every one of my children's transcript looked different. They just did. Um, but I want to say that there are two different ways to do a, a, a transcript. And I did both of them. Uh, one of them is ninth grade. We did this, 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 and this. Tenth grade, we did this, 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 and this. But there are, the other way to do it is to do it by subject. Math, social sciences, science, lab sciences. I had a daughter who it took her two years to get through algebra two. So I was able to just say math. Algebra one, geometry, algebra two. You may have a child who does algebra one in the eighth grade. Well, but you feel like it's high school work, it is. Mm -hmm. So you can put that under that math on the transcript. And again, I had to use both kinds for my different children for what they had. Um, see what your state requires. My state of Texas requires that ours are notarized and not all states require that and one thing i would say about notarizing is if you have to do it make copies of it because you're constantly asked for that transcript over time you'll want them for all your colleges but if your child transfers colleges they ask for it again so if i'm downloading it off my computer it's not notarized and i have to go do that again so just make copies um, when it comes to sunlight we have history and we have well science we all know about that but we have history and you can just say american history or government whatever but for literature you can uh, if you're doing 100 you could say introduction to literature if you're doing 400 you could say american literature or 600 british literature or just as sheila said you could say english slash composition one english slash composition two I would see what your college requires, but I think typically it's pretty general. We want four sciences, I mean, uh, three sciences, or we want four Englishes, and there you go. Yeah. So I actually awesome? have a sample of mine. Yes. I printed mine off, and I don't know if you can see it, it says official transcript across <laughs> the, the top. It's official because they I typed are. it. Yeah. Okay, you're pretty official over there. Yeah, you yeah. put your child's vital information, you know, email address and mailing address, and I zeroed all that out for this. But um, and then I did just like Sandy said, because my child had done high school level work in eighth grade and I wanted to count it. So like she has um five maths, four social sciences, five sciences three Spanishes, you know, so, um, so it's more than the minimum requirement. And, and all those extra classes can count as academic electives. So you don't have to fill it with all this fluffy stuff. I mean, she did take PE and um, photography and logic and things like that. So she, she did have some, a few fun electives, but otherwise, you know, she, she ended up with 24 credits. Um, but the majority of those credits were academic credits. Only five were elective, so, or four, whatever. I'll just add maybe one thing to that. When you, um, Sheila mentioned earlier about the dual credit, <clears throat> if you pick a few dual credits that you want to do, just, I would always be aware of, are you picking things that you want to do in dual credit that, um, you're okay with whoever the college professor is is essentially being your child's mentor so you might want to make sure that you might want to pick something that's more um 
like math or cut and dry. It just depends anyway. That's a whole other topic. But the other thing I was going to say is having dual credit on your, on your report card, having a few, is not a bad idea because if your child earned an A or a B, it kind of gives credence to the grades that you're putting down. Yes. That yes. mama didn't just make this up. <laughs> Right. Yes, that's a good point. And I did yes. mean, mean to bring that up as well. Yeah. Um, there is a website called Rate My Professor, and I would yes. scour that website yes. and, and read about each of the individual professors. And, um, you, you know, there, there are some key words that will clue you into certain things. And so we learned which professors to avoid and which ones were okay. Um, but yes, so when she made an A in college algebra and pre- pre-calculus at the college level, it yes. substantiated my A's that she got in geometry and algebra too. I mean, if she can get A's at the high school level, then all the other A's under it are valid. Yes. Right. right. Yep. Okay. So the last question I have is <clears throat> that oftentimes parents do not think they're worried about teaching high school, but you've all done it, right? So how do you reassure other parents that they too can do it? Sheila? Well, I've already alluded to this a little bit earlier, um, but first of all, when you use a curriculum like Sunlight Curriculum, it doesn't have to be, but that's my personal love. So when you use something like Sunlight, all the planning is done for you. So that takes away the scary, like, am I doing enough? Am I doing too much? It's, it's laid out for you. But I've already mentioned that you don't have to do it exactly as the instructor's guide is laid out. That is just a, um, a skeleton that you can start from. And then you can add or take away however you want for your child. You are the, the, the primary teacher and you get to make that call. So, but starting with something is so much better than starting from nothing, from zero and having to build it yourself. It's easier to alter than it is to invent. So that's one thing. Um, but then I also alluded to the fact that that when you are entering high school, you are moving into a different um, chapter. So you are phasing out of being the primary teacher in every single subject, and you are looking for other ways, other um, avenues that your child can learn those subjects. It might be an online class, you might hire a tutor, there may be a co-op locally that you can participate in. I have already mentioned the dual, enrollment classes. So know, know your strengths, be aware of your weaknesses and figure out how you can, you know, shore up that weak area of yours. Um, so you transition from being a, um, the main teacher to being a facilitator. You can um, participate in a co-op. Not all co-ops are created equal, let me warn you. So I would definitely do your research, um, interview people that are already in the co-op, find out about different teachers. Just like I said, I, I scoured the Rate My Professor website to read about the different uh, professors. You can also ask different parents about different tutors that are in a co-op program because some are better than others. We'll just leave it at that. And then um, the third thing is that... Um, you can be a mentor or you can find a mentor for your child. So mm -hmm. an example of that in my own life, I've already mentioned I have an English degree. So I'm supposed to be an English teacher. I did not teach in the classroom outside of college. I chose to stay home and raise my children and teach my own kids. But at the high school level, my daughter had a friend whose mom wasn't very comfortable teaching writing. And so we paired up and I taught both kids. So I was a mentor to my friend's daughter. Um, there is a lot, there are a lot of reasons of why that's a good thing, but one of them is that it's good for your child to start to learn under someone else. Because when they get to college, all of their teachers are gonna be different. And they're gonna learn <laughs> <laughs> that either you're an easy teacher or you're a hard teacher. Um, you, you do fun projects or you do not so fun projects. And there are other teachers who teach in a different way and they need to learn how to satisfy that teacher's requirement. So when you become a mentor to someone else's child, they learn under you and they learn that they have to satisfy your requirements. And when you place your child under someone else, they have to learn the same thing. And that is not a bad thing to start doing while they're still under your roof because you can help them work through those 
um, those feelings of why do I have to do this? This is so stupid or whatever, you know, um, and you can coach them you know, you're, you're a coach at this point. So you can coach them into how to handle that, how to advocate for themselves if they need to. It's not a bad thing. So I would just say it sounds scary. I understand, but it really is doable. It, when, when you look at all the different options that is available out there to you now, home, homeschooling is, is becoming more and more widespread, more and more accepted lots and lots of things offered to homeschoolers because we're a great market. So don't, don't let the fact, the fact of high school intimidate you. You can't me, do it. I want to add one point to what Sheila said when she was talking about mentors. When you get a mentor, especially if they're younger still, you want to make sure they're going to speak truth into your child. You know, Sheila is going to speak truth into her, her daughter's friend. And I just think that's important when they're younger because not, it's not just academics we want for our children. Yes. And just as a last note of encouragement for teaching high school, I will tell you just the way that God is faithful in your life every day. He will faithfully talk to you about what your child needs in a way that nobody else will be able to figure out. And he's faithful if you, sorry, if you ask him, he is going to answer and you will know. And sometimes it's just a small little, small little voice or a, maybe a new idea, but I can't tell you all the times because each of, I have five children, but they are all five different people and I didn't do it the same, but that's because God made them different. And so to meet their needs and yet prepare them, as Sheila said, for whatever it is they're going to do after high school. So yeah, just be encouraged. Be, rely on God, just like we are in these days. Rely on him. Yep. Very good. Thank you, Rhonda, Sheila, and Sandy for joining me to talk in detail about literature-based learning in high school. We hope that you have all found it as helpful as I did. Thank you. Mm -hmm.